Today we look at the CSEC English B point. It is the constant image of your face. It is one of the more cryptic poems on the syllabus. Not very straightforward. And the language in this poem is a little difficult. Still, once I break it down, you will come to a complete understanding of the poem. So stick around. Before I touch on the poem, I'll give you a brief background on the poet, Dennis Brutus. This will be important for putting the poem in context. He was born in 1924, almost a hundred years ago. He was a South African known for his activism against apartheid, which was a system of racial segregation. He accomplished quite a lot. You should definitely read his biography. Like Mandela, he spent many years trying to end this systematic segregation between the black and white people in South Africa. His reward for all this was being thrown in a prison cell next to Mandela's. He tried to escape prison and ended up being shot in the back at point-blank range. He was chased out of South Africa, exiled. He made England his new home. By 1971, he was living in the US. There he became a professor of African literature at Northwestern University. His British passport got cancelled in 1980 and he was threatened with deportation. But he somehow won that battle and got to stay in the US. Then in 1990 he was unbanned from South Africa to which he returned. In 2009 at the age of 85 he died in Cape Town, South Africa. With all that in mind I'll read the point and then we'll get into the analysis. It is the constant image of your face by Dennis Brutus. It is the constant image of your face framed in my hands as you knelt before my chair, the grave attention of your eyes surveying me amid my world of knives that stays with me, perennially accuses and convicts me of heart's treachery. And neither you nor I can plead excuses for you, you know, can claim no loyalty. My land takes precedence of all my loves. Yet I beg mitigation, pleading guilty, for you, my dear, accomplice of my heart, made without words such blackmail with your beauty, and preferred me such dear protectiveness, that I confess without remorse or shame, my still fresh treason to my country, and I hope that she, my other dearest love, will pardon freely, not attaching blame, being your mistress, or your match in tenderness. Before I begin the analysis, let me get one big thing out of the way. You might find what I'm about to say to be crazy, especially if you've watched or read other lessons or analyses of this poem. But as always, I will provide lots of evidence to support whatever I say. Are you ready? Here goes. There's only one person in this poem. The face mentioned in the title and opening line is not the face of a person, but rather the face of a country. Let's get into it. We start with line 1, which is the same as the title. Immediately we see that the speaker cannot get a certain face out of his mind. The image of the face is not there sometimes, but constantly. It is like he is haunted by this face. What might cause him to be constantly seeing this face? Love? I think the answer is guilt. He's guilty about something and so he can't get that face out of his mind. We see in line 2 that this face is framed in his hands. This phrase is interesting. We can imagine perhaps a woman kneeling before a man and the man gently holding her face in his hands, forming a frame around her face. But this line has within it a very subtle metaphor. Here, the image of the face is actually compared to a photograph one that is framed and which hangs on a wall, perhaps. The speaker is constantly seeing the face in his mind as clearly as if it were a picture hung on his living room wall. This reinforces how clear and constant the image of the face is. But remember what I said, the face here belongs not to a woman, but to a country. So the face and the kneeling and the eyes are all personification. Why is the country being personified so much? Because this man loves the country the same way a man might love a woman. So the man imagines the country, his love, to be kneeling before him with its face in his hands. This is a loving and tender moment. 
but also one riddled with guilt and sadness. We see that guilt and remorse, regret and shame are underlying tones in this poem. In the next line, we see that the grave attention, the serious somber attention of the eyes, of the face, are surveying or closely watching the speaker. So the speaker is being surveyed, being watched, judged, scrutinized. And we see that he is in a world of knives. This is a metaphor. It means he is in a very dangerous, a perilous world, a perilous situation or environment. Knives here conjure up images of stabbing and slicing, even killing. The speaker is in a world of knives, so he is in constant danger. He is in a very difficult position. He faces the constant possibility of being stabbed in the back or even in the front. Let's get back to the eyes. The eyes, through personification, are said to convict the speaker of heart's treachery. Treachery is betrayal of one's country. The eyes of this woman, which are really a country, are accusing or convicting the speaker of treachery. We see that the accusation is perennial, which basically means constant. And we see that the eyes stay with him. By the way, some might argue that heart's treachery is an oxymoron, since heart is associated with love and loyalty, and treachery is the opposite of love and loyalty. So we have kind of sifted through the first six lines, but let's put them together so we can build a picture of what's really happening so far. We see here a speaker who is in a difficult, dangerous situation, where he can't trust anyone, where at any point he could be betrayed or attacked. Also, we see that he has betrayed a country, and that country is constantly watching and accusing him. Is this country he's talking to, which is represented by the woman in front of him, his homeland? Is he remembering the image of his homeland's face? No, this is not his homeland, but a different country. You'll see why in a minute. By the way, with diction like accuse and convict, the poem is giving us some courtroom language, so the speaker here might be a politician or political activist, or might in some other way be responsible for serving his country. In the next line, the speaker is telling this country that neither of them can plead excuses. It means the speaker is admitting that what he did was inexcusable. He has no excuse. But the line also suggests that this betrayal is a two-way street, that just as he betrayed the country, the country has also betrayed him. Why would the country need to plead excuses unless it was also wrong? Also, if we read the sentence into the next line, it says, and neither you nor I can plead excuses for you. Who is the you here? Of course, it's the country. So basically, the speaker is saying that both he and the country are wrong. They betrayed each other. Let's go to the next line. For you, you know, can claim no loyalty. Again, we have double meanings. First, it means that the country cannot demand loyalty from the speaker. Why? Because according to the next line, the speaker's land, in this case, the speaker's homeland, takes precedence of all his loves. In other words, the speaker loves many countries, but he loves his homeland the most. And so no other country should expect him to be loyal to them. There is a second meaning of the second to last line of the stanza. For you, you know, can claim no loyalty. It could mean that just as how the speaker cannot claim to have been loyal to the country, the country cannot claim to have been loyal to him. Neither of them can make that claim, as they have both been disloyal. They both, as I said earlier, betrayed each other. Okay. It might be a little confusing so far, so let's make an analogy. Imagine a married man who has six or seven side chicks. One of the side chicks is kneeling before him. The woman before him is a side chick. She's upset. He is holding her face in his hands. She feels betrayed, hurt. But the married man is saying to her, Why are you upset? I already told you from the beginning that my wife is my number one, and I will never leave her. This is the situation here, but instead of a wife, we have a homeland, a home country. 
And instead of a side chick, we have another country that the speaker has lived in or has visited. He's saying he cannot love this new country as much as he loves his original country. Let's cheat a little bit, no pun intended at all, and go back to the poet's biography. Since the biography is not within the poem, and since we can't be sure whether the poem is autobiographical, we can't use his biography as evidence for our interpretations. However, we can look at his biography for some ideas as to what the poem might be about. After that, we have to find all the evidence we need within the poem itself. That's how it works. So Brutus loved his country, South Africa. He tried to fix a terrible problem in his country, apartheid. Eventually, he was banished from his country and took refuge in England. After that, he moved to America. In the first stanza, he might be talking to England or America. I think it's America. He's saying to America, I can't love you as much as I love my homeland, South Africa. But don't get it twisted, he does love America, as we will continue to see. Why is America kneeling before him, crying? Why does America feel betrayed? Because in 1990, Brutus left America and went back to South Africa, where he eventually died. So it's like the man leaving the side chick after all and going back to his wife and the side chick feeling betrayed. This feels to America, to this country kneeling before him, like a betrayal. But remember, they both betrayed each other. So now we see how Brutus, or actually how the speaker, betrays this country kneeling before him. But how did America betray Brutus? How did this country betray the speaker? Well, remember, in 1980, he almost got deported. He could consider that a betrayal. So far, we see a speaker torn between two loves, between two countries. He feels like he's betraying the side chick country. But at the same time, he can't help but put his wife, his homeland, at the number one spot in his heart. Love and patriotism are dominant themes so far. So far, the tone is one of guilt, reflection, confusion. We have been seeing a lot of language that points to law, politics, and that kind of thing, which reinforces the theme of patriotism. Such words are accuses, convicts, treachery, and precedents. Let's go down to stanza two. The speaker is still talking to the side chick country. Now he is begging mitigation, which is a reduced sentencing, a light sentence. So we're continuing with the courtroom language here. We can kind of imagine this whole poem as playing out like a court case, if you want to imagine it in that way. But perhaps instead of regular court, this might be divorce court, family court, something like that. While he pleads guilty, he's asking for mercy. He isn't asking to not be punished, but he simply doesn't want a harsh punishment. But we see that while he's acting all guilty, he still continues to hold the country, the side chick, partially responsible for his disloyalty. He maintains that he's not the only one at fault. He calls this country, my dear, buttering her up. But then he calls her the accomplice of his heart. Accomplice is another word of the law. An accomplice is someone who helps out in a crime. They might not be the main culprit, but they somehow contributed to the crime. Here, he's saying that this country that he has betrayed is partly to blame. He explains why in the next lines. The country blackmailed him with her beauty. Blackmail is another term we hear a lot in those lawyer shows. To blackmail someone is to extort or threaten them, to force them to do something with the condition that if they do not do it, you will in some way expose or humiliate or harm them. So maybe I know that you stole some cookies. If you don't give me one cookie every day for two years, plus do all my homework every night, I'll tell the police that you stole the cookies. That is blackmail. So the speaker is saying the side chick country blackmailed him with her beauty. So she sort of forced him to fall in love with her, tempting him with her beauty. If you want to go back to the life of Dennis Brutus, 
then you could say that America had tempted, had enticed him to live there. There he could enjoy perhaps a higher quality of life than he had enjoyed in South Africa. Also, he got a nice cushy job as a professor. The speaker is saying, this new country where he probably now lives blackmailed him with her beauty. So here, the speaker is actually making two accusations at once. The poem is shifting. First, the speaker was the one who seemed to be guilty. But now it seems as if the side chick is even guiltier than he is. The first accusation is that of the blackmail. The second accusation is that this new country forced or encouraged him to betray his homeland. So back to our analogy. It's like a married man cheating on his wife with a younger woman and then blaming the younger woman for being too beautiful. What else did this side chick country do? She preferred the speaker such protectiveness. To prefer means to give. So this country enticed the speaker with its beauty and then gave him safety, protection. Perhaps his homeland is not such a safe country and this new country is tempting him because he knows he will be safer there. If we look at the life of Brutus, this makes sense. He was almost killed by the South African government for having tried to stop apartheid. He was thrown in prison and remember that he was exiled from his country. So he was not allowed to stay there. He fled to a safer country, England, and then to America. This is where the dare protectiveness comes in when looking at the life of Brutus. Anyhow, since Brutus isn't explicitly in the poem, what we can take from this line is that the country that seduced him away from his homeland, and we're dealing with the speaker, not with Brutus, offered him refuge, safety. If you take Brutus out of the picture, it could just mean that the speaker's homeland is ravaged by war or crime. Even though I'm going line by line, it's important to realize that the last stanza is just one long sentence. I'll read this stanza again, from the beginning to line 6. Yet I beg mitigation, pleading guilty, for you, my dear, accomplice of my heart, made without words such blackmail with your beauty, and proffered me such dear protectiveness, that I confess without remorse or shame my still fresh treason to my country. Here he is saying, you, my new love, my new country, have offered me a sense of safety that I can freely talk to you even about the most difficult things. I can confess to you without remorse or shame how I have cheated on my homeland. You make me feel so secure that I can open up and be honest with you. I can vent to you. This is like the man cheating on his wife, being with another woman, confiding with this other woman because he feels like he can't talk to his wife. Maybe his wife is too judgmental or just doesn't make the time to listen to him or argues with him every chance she gets. So he is telling his new country that by being with her, he is betraying his home country. We see that the treason is still fresh, which might mean it is recent, or the emotions connected to it are still strong. In the last lines, the speaker is saying, I hope my homeland can forgive me for my treason. In the marriage analogy, I hope my wife can forgive me for cheating on her. He says that his homeland is his other dearest love. But how can you have two dearest love? He's still confused. And clearly his loyalty is still divided. Look at the last two lines. The speaker hopes that his homeland, his wife, will not blame his side chick country for the unfaithfulness. Here, he says that his homeland is his new country's mistress or match in tenderness. The meaning is, his homeland is as loving and as tender as this new country. He's hoping that this tenderness will cause her, which is his homeland, to forgive him. The word match here makes sense, since both countries are equally as tender. But why does he use the word mistress? I think it is because a mistress can mean a woman in authority, which would be the female equivalent to a master. So here the man is saying his home country is the new country's master when it comes down to tenderness. His home country is even more tender, more loving, more gentle, kinder. Then he says, or your match, perhaps to appease the new country. 
So basically, the last line is saying, you, my new country, are tender. But my old country, my homeland, is even more tender. Or at least just as tender as you are. I think the point of that line is that he's optimistic that his homeland will forgive him and take him back. As we look back at the life of Brutus, we see that South Africa did take him back. In the end, his ban from his country was revoked. His exile ended and he returned home after being away for a long time. I think most people would interpret this poem to be about a man being torn between his country and a woman. However, as I've been pointing out, the evidence would strongly suggest that most people are wrong. And the poem is instead about a man torn between two countries. He loves both countries and wants each country to forgive him for also loving the other. Whatever your thoughts on the poem, once you can properly support your interpretation, once you can back it up with textual evidence, you're fine in my book. If you think the speaker is torn between a woman and a country, then you would be able to explore the theme of patriotic versus romantic love in this poem. This is one of the trickier poems I've analyzed so far. I hope this video made the poem much clearer for you. See you in the next one. And as always, thanks for watching.